Hey, welcome back to the South Stands, a Buckeye football podcast by Ohio State fans for Ohio State fans from the West Coast. I'm your host, Zach Moore. Today is Sunday, November 10th, 2024. And thank you for joining me as I talk to myself about number two Ohio State's workmanlike 45 to nothing dismantling of Purdue in Columbus yesterday. Now, after the game on subtext, Doug Maurice called it an exceedingly professional win for the Buckeyes. And with this win, Ryan Day's record against unranked teams is now 44 to zero. Look, we are very well aware of Day's shortcomings in matchup games in recent seasons, but that spotless record against unranked teams is something Miami fans wish they could say this morning about their head coach after losing to unranked Georgia Tech yesterday, or even Clemson fans could say about Dabo Sweeney after getting thumped at home by unranked Louisville last Saturday. So credit to Ryan Day for uh, managing to avoid any trip ups against unranked opponents, especially in November. Now, I thought I had a pretty good handle on this game. My score prediction was 45-7, to so not too far off. I thought Ohio State would be able to do whatever it wanted against a Purdue team that is struggling mightily this season in every single facet. And that's what happened. We saw a lot of experimentation on both sides of the football for the Buckeyes. We saw a lot of Ohio State reserves rotating in early and often. On defense, for the first time this season, we got a glimpse of the Jim Knowles base defense with three down linemen and a stand-up jack. That was in the first quarter on Purdue's third possession of the game. And it was Mitchell Melton at the jack, Caden Curry and Kenyatta Jackson on the edges, and Caden McDonald over the center. C.J. Hicks was also one of the linebackers on that drive. Now, (laughs) it didn't really work because Purdue was in a run-heavy formation most of the drive. The Buckeyes didn't have enough men in the box, and the front was almost entirely reserve defenders. Purdue running back Devin Mockaby ran for 34 yards on the drive. But look, the point is Jim Knowles used yesterday as perhaps his last opportunity in live game action to really experiment. So I appreciated that. We saw Ryan Day being very intentional about trying to make more plays with his special teams yesterday. For the first time since 2022, the Buckeyes blocked a punt in this game that was in the first quarter by Caden Curry and Kate Curry man every time he comes in the game he seems to make something happen uh, and the block by Curry set the Buckeyes up inside the Purdue 10 yard line for their first touchdown of the game which was a one yard run on fourth and goal by Will Howard we saw a little bit of Trey Henderson as a kick returner we saw Caleb Downs as the return man on punts they even used Denzel Burke as a jammer to block gunners on punt returns to try and make something happen uh, in the return game for the Buckeyes on offense, look, the results were somewhat mixed, but we saw several jet sweeps with Quinchon Judkins and Trey Henderson. There was a nifty touchdown pass from Will Howard to G. Scott on a delayed release by Scott that left him wide open in the flat for a walk-in touchdown from 15 yards out. And it was a load management day for many of Ohio State star players. Only 35 snaps for Emeka Ibuka. That was his lowest snap count since the Marshall game. Only 25 snaps apiece for JT Tuimolowau and Jack Sawyer. And 35 snaps for Cody Simon. Those were their lowest totals since the Western Michigan game. Now, Tyleek Williams was available and in uniform, but he was given the afternoon off completely. Freshman Edric Hewson got the first start of his career in place of Williams. He played pretty well, though he did commit a silly personal foul penalty in this game. But look, this was exactly how Ryan Day drew it up. And it might be the last such game the Buckeyes play of the 2024 season. Northwestern is no juggernaut, but they're a much more competent team than Purdue. And that game next week is being played in Chicago in a baseball stadium. And you just never know what you're going to get, you know, weather-wise in that part of the country in mid-November. And the last time Ohio State played Northwestern two years ago at Ryan Field, it was a slop fest on a slick turf in gale force winds. The Buckeyes managed to grind out an ugly 21 to 7 win that day so as i like to do on sundays i'm gonna tick down a short list of observations from yesterday's game i also want to leave a few minutes at the end to touch on indiana's narrow escape over michigan yesterday afternoon that was an interesting result that has me thinking about both future opponents for the buckeyes as we know the buckeyes close out the regular season against the hoosiers and wolverines in consecutive weeks But let's start with the offense, and I want to go straight to the play of the offensive line. Now, PFF has a proprietary stat called pass blocking efficiency, which on a 0 to 100 scale measures pressure allowed on a per snap basis. 
Now, all five starters on the offensive line yesterday graded out at 96 or higher. Donovan Jackson and Tegra Shabola finished with PBE grades of 100. Only four total pressures allowed by the offensive line yesterday. Now, I know Purdue on the defensive line isn't exactly the 1985 Chicago Bears, but they are still a Big Ten opponent. So give a little credit to the offensive line for giving Will Howard a clean pocket most of the day. In only his second career start at left tackle, Donovan Jackson's PFF grade for pass blocking yesterday was 87.4. That led the team. In 27 pass blocking reps, Jackson did not give up a single pressure. Now, there was a scary moment when Carson Hinsman went down briefly with what looked like a knee injury, but Hinsman was able to leave the field under his own power and he would return to the game. Next week is a new challenge for the left side of the offensive line and the week after that and the week after that. But... For the second game in a row, Jackson and Hinsman held up really well on the left side of the Ohio State offensive line. And for the second week in a row, no false starts or holding penalties by the starting offensive line. So I like what I'm seeing out of the Ohio State offensive line right now. The Buckeyes finished the day with 433 yards of total offense at 6.6 yards per play. And they were decently balanced, 260 yards through the air, 173 on the ground. Now, it did take them a while to get the running game going. More on that in a minute. The Ohio State offense was also 6 of 6 in the red zone with five touchdowns. As an offense, Ohio State leads the country in red zone touchdown percentage. On 34 red zone trips so far this season, the Buckeyes have scored 30 touchdowns. That is ruthless efficiency for Chip Kelly's offense. Now, in our preview pod on Thursday, I told Paige that I wanted to see Will Howard clean up the mistakes. He had a few too many mistakes for my liking these last few games. Howard had two turnovers last week against Penn State. He threw an interception against Nebraska. But yesterday, Howard played as close to a mistake-free football game as I think you can have. He was 21 of 26 for 260 yards passing. He accounted for four touchdowns, three passing, one rushing. I thought he made much better reads on his RPOs and in the zone read. He was sacked only once. Now, he did come up a little short on a long ball to Carnell Tate that likely would have gone for a touchdown, but that's really the only negative play that I can remember from Howard. So a nice bounce back performance from Howard in this game after playing, by his own admission, his worst game of the season last week at Penn State. Now, with Emeka Igbuka enjoying a load management day, playing only 35 snaps, Will Howard leaned on the young guys, Jeremiah Smith and Carnell Tate yesterday. They combined for 12 receptions on 14 targets for 143 yards. Smith caught a 17-yard touchdown pass from Howard on a crosser, and then Smith just outran his man to the goal line. If you are only watching Ohio State for the first time yesterday, you would not know that Smith is only a true freshman and Tate a sophomore. There is an uncanny maturity to both of their games. They run precise routes. They block well in the run game. They catch every ball that's thrown at them. And they can both take the top off of a defense. And they're just as effective in their short and intermediate routes as they are going long. So... You know, we know this. The future is extremely bright for the Ohio State receiver room with those two, you know, with several years of eligibility remaining. But I think the best all around performance of the day was from Trevion Henderson. Henderson finished the afternoon with 146 all purpose yards. He ran for 85 and a touchdown on only six carries. He caught three passes for 43 yards. He also had an 18 yard kick return. Henderson continues to maximize every single one of his touches. He's averaging a career-high 7.5 yards per carry this season. And credit to the coaching staff for managing his workload. And look, they've got the luxury of Quinchon Judkins allowing them to do that. And I'm going to knock on wood as I say this, but look, it's mid-November and Henderson has not missed a game and he looks every bit as explosive now as he did in the opener. So that is great news for Travion Henderson and the Ohio State offense. Now, the one small critique I do have of the offense, I mentioned it earlier, was that it did take the running game a little while to get going in in this one. Ohio State only had 60 yards rushing on 15 carries at the half. They were much better after halftime, though, 113 yards on 20 carries. But Quinchon Judkins never really got it going yesterday. Only 32 yards on 11 carries for Judkins. And you could see him visibly frustrated after a few of those carries. Judkins has been somewhat of a feast or famine back this season for the Buckeyes. Now, he ran extremely well 
against really good run defenses in Penn State and Iowa this season. He averaged six yards a carry in both of those games, or over six yards per carry in both of those games. And he ran possessed on that final possession to run out the clock against Penn State last Saturday. I'm not sure Ohio State wins that game without that effort from Judkins. But yesterday was the third game this season that Judkins was limited to under three yards per carry. Nebraska and Oregon were the other two. Judkins ran for only 29 yards against the Huskers and 23 yards against the Ducks. He also had a fumble in that game against Oregon. Now, the struggles of the offensive line in the wake of the Josh Simmons injury had a little something to do with that, I think. But it also seems like Judkins sometimes struggles to see the whole field and, and find the open running lanes. And... You know, if he were at Ole Miss, he would probably be getting more carries to kind of work through those struggles. But his carry, his carries are somewhat limited here at Ohio State. And again, this is just a small critique. On the whole, Judkins has been an extremely valuable addition to this offense. He's still averaging over six yards per carry this season. And he leads the team both in rushing yards with 647 and in rushing touchdowns with six. Now, on the other side of the ball, it was another excellent showing from the Ohio State defense, albeit against a very limited Purdue offense. But for the first time in 15 years, the Silver Bullets posted their second shutout of the season. The Buckeye defense had not posted multiple shutouts in a season since 2009. That was 15 years ago when they had three of them. Uh, In this era of college football, you know, with scoring way up uh, over previous eras, I, I think it's saying something when your defense can pitch multiple shutouts. And uh, at the end of the telecast, there was also an interesting graphic posted by the Fox, uh, the Fox broadcast team, which uh, showed that Ohio state had not allowed an offensive touchdown in the last 128 minutes and 50 seconds of game time. That's a pretty impressive stat. Also the Buckeyes have allowed only two offensive touchdowns since the second half of the Oregon game. So, uh, you know, a lot to like about what we're seeing from the Ohio State defense. Purdue only had one real drive that wasn't aided by an Ohio State penalty, and that was the one that I mentioned at the top. Jim Knowles was experimenting with a three-man defensive front using a group of reserves. And once the Buckeyes got back into their base defense with their starters, the Boilermakers couldn't do anything. The defense held Purdue to 206 yards of total offense, 3.5 yards per play. They forced two turnovers, which included a scoop and score by Jack Sawyer. Lathan Ransom also came up with an interception of Hudson Card in the third quarter. The Buckeyes finished with four sacks and five tackles for loss. According to PFF, they had 21 pressures on Hudson Card yesterday, which I believe is a season high. And those were token pressures. I mean, Hudson Card was clearly under duress and the pressure from the Buckeye defensive front was really affecting him, even when they weren't getting home. Uh, Doug Maurice said it in, in the, after the game, and I agree, Jim Knowles seems to be getting closer to the ideal balance between not giving up explosive plays, but being aggressive when he needs to with his pressures. And I think we've seen that now for three straight games. The Ohio State defense has been much more effective at bringing pressure on opposing quarterbacks, and they seem to be much more creative in how they're bringing that pressure. Cody Simon, for example, had a sack on a simulated pressure for the second week in a row in this game, and Knowles is using his safeties to create timely pressures as well. If there is such a thing as a good productive loss, then I think that one point loss at Oregon certainly qualifies as that because it forced Ohio State to reassess coaching scheme and personnel when it comes to bringing pressure on the quarterback. Give the coaches and players credit. The scheme and execution has been much better these last three weeks after that dreadful zero sack performance against Dylan Gabriel, where he really carved up the Ohio State secondary. Ohio State has eight sacks in their last three games. In only 25 snaps, I thought JT Tui Molowau was excellent yesterday. He finished with the defense's highest overall PFF grade of 91.7 and the highest grade against the run of 93.5. He finished with one and a half tackles for loss and a forced fumble, which Jack Sawyer scooped up and returned for a touchdown. He also led the team in pressures with four. I said this last week. JT is quietly putting together a very good statistical season. He leads the team in tackles for loss with 10 and sacks with five. On the season, he has the defense's third highest overall PFF grade of 83.7. He has the defense's second highest grade against the run of 88.5. And he's second on the team in quarterback pressures with 24. I mean, it's hard to imagine him having a bigger impact on this defense than he's had so far. And I'm not sure... 
the average Ohio State fan is really appreciating it because, again, we set the bar so high for Tui Molowau. You know, we've expected him to be the next Chase Young. He's clearly not been that, but he's been a very, very good player for them th- throughout his career. And I think he's having his best season so far this year. I also love what I saw from Lathan Ransom yesterday. In only 38 snaps, Ransom finished just behind Tui Molowau with an overall PFF grade of 91.5. He also finished with the defense's highest PFF grade for tackling and coverage. He had a punishing hit on Hudson Card along the sidelines in the first half. He also intercepted Card in the end zone to snuff out a Purdue scoring threat midway through the third quarter. So another great performance by Lathan Ransom. He is having an all Big Ten, potentially an all-American season for the Buck guys i will say though the buckeyes did miss too many tackles yesterday according to pff the buckeyes had 18 missed tackles without looking it up i believe that's probably a season high i mean i can think of at least two one by cj hicks and another by sunny styles on hudson card that should have been sacks and in the early going i thought the buckeyes had some issues bringing down devin mockaby by the way mockaby's a good player He was probably the lone bright spot for the Purdue offense in this game. 73 yards on 13 carries. I think that was one of the better performances we've seen from an opposing running back against the Buckeyes this season. And, you know, Maccabee was good against the Buckeyes in last year's game. He ran for over 100 yards as well. But still, you would expect better tackling from the Buckeyes against Maccabee and the rest of the Purdue offense. They got to be better than 18 missed tackles, and, and I'm sure they will be. My only remaining concern, though, with this defense is at cornerback. We saw another long pass completion on Denzel Burke and another pass interference penalty on Davis and Igbenosin in this game. And I, th- I think we can safely say nine games into this season, you know, relative to the lofty preseason expectations for these two, Burke and Igbenosin are both having disappointing seasons. Of the starting 11, they have the lowest overall PFF grades. They're both grading out at 67 overall. They're the only starters on the starting defense that have a score under 70. Igbenosin has a coverage grade of 64.9. Burke's coverage grade is 67.2. And I said this to our text thread earlier this week. Folks have talked about Denzel Burke like he's Denzel Ward or Jeff Okuda, but he's not playing anywhere close to that level this season. And I'm not sure he's ever played close to that level in his career. I mean, just for context, in 2017, Denzel Ward, who had an All-American season that made him a top five pick, had an overall PFF grade of 90.8 and a coverage grade of 92.2. In 2019, Jeff Okuda, who had an All-American season that year that made him a top three pick, had an overall PFF grade of 82.8 and a coverage grade of 85.9. Denzel Burke's grades are 20 to 25 points lower than Ward and Akuda. And watching watching him play, your eyes will tell you, Burke is really, he's just an average cornerback in coverage right now by Ohio State standards. He really is. And opposing quarterbacks are unafraid to throw at him. And Igbenosin is, he's the defense's runaway leader in penalties with nine. Nine penalties. After Igbenosin, Jordan Hancock and Lorenzo Styles have two apiece. And after them, no other Buckeye has more than one. <laughs> so uh, now, now one thing I will say about both Igbenosin and Burke, they do tackle really, really well. Igbenosin actually leads the team with a tackling grade of 88.1. Burke is third on the team with a tackling grade of 80.1. They both play the run very well. So give them credit for that. That is really important in a line of scrimmage league like the Big Ten. But look, I don't want to say they've got to get better in coverage as Ohio State you know moves toward the playoff they're going to see much better quarterbacks they're going to see much better receivers they just have to get better in coverage Burke has to do a better job of finding and competing for the football when it's in the air and Iggy I I don't know what to tell you dude you have NFL size and athleticism find a way to fucking cover receivers without mugging them buddy (laughs) But as I say, that is the lone critique I have for this defense, which has otherwise been smothering. Right now, the Buckeyes are number one nationally in total defense. They're number two in scoring defense. They're sixth against a run. They're fourth against the pass. Going into yesterday's game, they were fifth nationally in stop rate. They're damn near impossible to score on in the red zone. They lead the country in opponent red zone scoring percentage. So there's a lot to love still with the Buckeyes. You know, that one critique about the corners notwithstanding. 
Okay, real quick, before I let you go, I want to spend a minute or two on Indiana's 20 to 15 victory over Michigan in Bloomington yesterday. This was IU's first real test of the season. It was their only real scare so far. Now, things seem to be going mostly as planned for Kirk Signetti's Hoosiers in the first half. They took a 17 to 3 lead in the, in the, into the half, but then they had to hang on for dear life as the Michigan defensive front dominated the second half. Michigan sacked Curtis Rourke four times. They held the IU rushing attack to only 1.4 yards per carry. IU's best receiver, Elijah Surratt, had 30, uh, he had a 36 yard touchdown catch in the second quarter, but that was his only reception of the game. He was otherwise shut down by the Michigan secondary. And Surratt also had a huge drop late in the fourth quarter as IU was trying to hold off Michigan's uh, rally. Bottom line, if it weren't for the utter incompetence of the Michigan offense and quarterback Davis Warren, IU loses this game. I mean, they were very fortunate Warren couldn't hit the broadside of a barn with a football. Warren finished the day 16 to 32 for 137 yards passing at 4.3 yards per attempt. And I also felt like for the first time you could you could see the limitations of the Indiana skill players. They're they're solid, they're good, their assignments sound, but I don't know that we can say that they're particularly dynamic. The Michigan defense, which, you know, again, still has a lot of NFL players, is they're the best unit, defense or offense, that Indiana has seen all season. I mean, the Hoosiers haven't seen anything on either side of the ball that really comes close to the talent of the Michigan defense. And I thought the Michigan defense really controlled this game after halftime. I mean, they put the IU offense in a chokehold, only three points after halftime for the Hoosiers, and they, they could not protect Curtis Rourke. Now, give IU credit for finding a way to eke this one out. They got a big play on special teams, a 22-yard punt return from Keyshawn Williams to help get them into field goal range to push the lead out to five points, which was huge because Michigan's place kicker, Dominic Zavada, is lethal. I mean, that dude can make kicks from 60-plus yards with ease. And all Michigan would have needed to do is cross the 50-yard line, and they're pretty much in Zavada's range. So... Looking at this game through an Ohio State lens, I saw both an opportunity and a cautionary tale for the Buckeyes. Opportunity in the sense that I think Ohio State can replicate what Michigan did to the Indiana offense. I think the Buckeyes have the personnel on defense to take away the Indiana run game and put the same level of pressure on Curtis Rourke. The only difference, though, for IU is they'll be facing a completely different challenge in the Ohio State offense than they did in Michigan, which will be unlike anything they've seen this season. They have not seen anything like Jeremiah Smith, Emeka Buka, Travion Henderson, you know, that crew. And they have not seen a quarterback that's playing anywhere close to as well as Will Howard is this season. Now, the cautionary tale in it for me was with the issues Ohio State has had on the left side of the offensive line, beware the Michigan defensive front. Do not let Michigan drag you into a fist fight in a phone booth, Ryan Day, where all of a sudden it's a close game in the fourth quarter and Michigan has the most dangerous weapon in the game in Dominic Zavada. <laughs> it, that would not be the first time we'd see Michigan do that over the decades. You know, in this rivalry, you know, we've seen lesser Michigan teams do that, drag, you know, a, 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 an otherwise superior Ohio State roster into a fist fight in a phone booth in a low scoring game and they win it with their defense and special teams. So that's the cautionary tale in that performance in that game for me uh, for the Buckeyes. OK, that's going to do it for me. I'm going to have a lot more to say about Indiana and Michigan in the coming weeks, of course. The Buckeyes first have to worry about a trip to Wrigley Field to play Northwestern. That's next Saturday. Check your feeds for a preview of that game from Paige, Chad, and me this coming Thursday. Until then, thanks so much for listening, and go Bucks. You've been listening to The South Stands, a Buckeye football podcast. Follow us on X at South underscore stands.